Hello, America. It's a place, an idea, a historic vision, an act of colonization, a shorthand for a nation. The word has many meanings, which we're going to explore today through Lakota artwork from 19th uh, and early 20th centuries, as well as a contemporary painting by Joan Quick to see Smith. Welcome back to BMA NIMWA, the monthly talk show that's always focused on work by women artists and always extremely live. Today's show <laughs> focuses on America. I'm Addie Gayoso, and I'm an educator at the National Museum of Women in the Arts in DC. And I'm Veronica Bettencourt from the Baltimore Museum of Art. Um, and I'd also like to introduce one of my colleagues, Dara Turner, uh, assistant curator of Miss Art the Americas at the BMA is joining us today. Uh, she is also the curator of Stripes and Stars, Reclaiming Lakota Independence. It's so wonderful to be here today. I'm really excited to chat with you both. Thanks, Dear. Thanks for joining us. Um, and though we're in a digital space uh, and a little divorced from anything like a shared physical place, we can't talk America without talking about the land that the U.S. occupies. Um, so I want to share a land acknowledgement uh, statement that the Baltimore Museum of Art drafted on the occasion of this exhibition, Stripes and Stars, Reclaiming Lakota Independence, which is currently on view at the BMA. So as part of the Baltimore Museum of Arts, ongoing broad range of initiatives related to diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion the museum recognizes that we occupy land that generations of indigenous people reside upon and have stewarded. BMA is committed to engaging local historians, scholars, and most importantly, indigenous people in the coming years to reflect on our obligations to and relationship with this land, its history, and its people. So, um, thinking about all the indigenous, uh, this exhibition uh, features work made by Lakota women that includes imagery of the U.S. Um, and Derek, could you tell us a little bit more about how you kind of came to this work? Yeah, absolutely. So I started working at the BMA in 2017 and had the great privilege of exploring our collection in the storeroom and vault. And I came across this bonnet here, which is child size. It was made for a girl. And I looked up the, the information about it and was really surprised to learn that a Lakota woman in the 1890s or so made this bonnet for her child. So the big question I was asking myself is why would a Lakota person put the flag on a child's bonnet? Um, and it's, it's particularly confusing when you think about the context that this came out of. So the 1890s, 1880s and 1890s were um, really bad decades for the Lakota people. They were forced onto the reservation by the US government and had suffered really bad losses in military conflicts. And in the 1890s, um, the Wounded Knee Massacre took place. So to think, uh, you know, it was hard to reconcile that history with this object here. And I also wanna look at one other object that was made for a child which is a boy's vest here. Mm -hmm. And similarly, we're, we're considering why a mom would put this kind of imagery on her child's clothing. So um, these are all questions at the heart of this exhibition. And I wanna put it in conversation with you two and um, you know, answer any questions you might have about the show and the organization. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, dear, I think that that central question about like, why include the US flag um, on Lakota garments? You know, this is not just putting a US flag up somewhere around, you know, your vicinity. This is putting it on your person um, and making it for a child. So it's a really uh, thoughtful and significant, and I think, you know, kind of politically fraught and charged act. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, as you were going through the research and kind of trying to make sense of this bonnet and vest and storeroom, like what were some of the things that uh, came forth for you and that you kind of explored in the show? 
Yeah. So the biggest question is why the Lakota tribe, who was was historically an enemy of the U.S. government, would embrace this emblem. But tribes like the Crow people, who aligned themselves with the U.S. government in fighting the Lakota, don't we don't see nearly the number of flags in, in their beaded garments and works. Um, so thinking about the trajectory of the flag and its representation in Lakota art, um, maybe we can back up a bit in time and take a look at this ledger drawing on the next slide. You know, Derek, you're making it seem it's almost like we practiced. <laughs> oh, whoops. You know, I said that and then I accidentally muted you with my mouse. So as Addie said, it's always extremely live. Um, so thanks for joining us. Tara, if you wouldn't mind maybe explaining the ledger drawing again, that would be great. Yeah, <laughs> no, no problem, no problem. So this was created by an artist, Amos Badhart Bull, who was of a generation that followed um, the Battle of Little Bighorn. But this took place, this battle took place in 1876. And it was one of the most decisive victories for the Lakota people in the Plains War period. And the really interesting to th thing to think about is the fact that this was the centennial anniversary of the foundation of America. So the fact that the Lakota, you know, really um, beat the, the U.S. government um, quite severely in this battle was was something that provoked some shame and maybe encouraged the US government to lock down even further in the coming years. So here we see uh, a Lakota artist representing the flag and indicating that it means, um, or it reflects the enemy on the battlefield. So we don't see the Lakota in this in this work engaging with the flag directly. We we see it um, sort of as the adversary. But thinking back mm -hmm. to um, the subsequent decades in which the flag was adopted on beadwork, we start to think about the creators. So ledger art typically is drawn by men, and when we think about mothers creating um, works like the the beaded bonnet and the vest, we start to consider what the, what role they were trying to assume and what, what message they were trying to send by including the flag and protecting their kids with this flag. So ultimately the core, the core um, sort of through line with these child's objects is that their family members were trying to protect them. And we have wonderful images from the, a photograph from the 1890s in which a mom is standing by her beautiful children. And we see the flag on the vest and on the, the cradle model there. So here, mm -hmm. this mother is living on the reservation with her children. They're in a whole new era of their existence, doing something really unfamiliar to them. They had previously been a nomadic tribe that would follow the buffalo, mm -hmm. but the buffalo were almost extinct at this point. And the US government forced these people on the reservation. So women took the opportunity to really embrace this artistic um, production and this, this um, mode of, of communication. And when we think about the experience of white reservation agents who were um, the people leading the, the reservation and enforcing rules, if we put our mind in, into their mind, we could see that maybe they would view these children more favorably if they were wearing the flag very prominently on their clothes. So that's, I love this photograph. I just think it's so evocative. Dare, I'm really I mean, curious it, about um, some of the, this beating you, you mentioned earlier when we chatted in advance of this program, how, um, how um, challenging it is, how, how difficult it is. And I'm wondering if, I know that we have a few other images of some work made by Lakota women for their children, and it's absolutely exquisite. And I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit more about some of the hallmarks of Lakota beading and, and just a little bit more about, um, share a little bit more about that, that craft. Um, yeah. So the, the boys' pants on the left here are, are really emblematic of um, Lakota beadwork in that they are fully beaded. That's the biggest um, commonality we see between all of these different forms. There was this joke on during the reservation days that Lakota be women would bead 
anything that stayed still. So here we see these fully beaded pants. And when we think about the experience of the boy wearing these pants, it probably wasn't a super comfortable experience. And these are heavy. And this is a, a child, you know, bearing the weight of these. There are some garments that weighed like 20 pounds just by the sheer weight of the beads. So I think the biggest commonality we see is the, the number of beads. The other piece that's worth um, addressing is the fact that often the background was white white beads. So we see this really, and that highlights the crispness of the design. So you can see the, the horses at the top of those pants. We get a real sense for their personality because we can see their, their front hooves kind of flared back. And that's indicated, that indicates that these horses were different sorts of horses, just like people have personalities horses have personalities too. Um, so just the intricacy of the beadwork is something that is a hallmark of Lakota beadwork from this period. So if we're thinking about those mothers here, and then um, another thing to consider is that vests and cowboy boots are not historic um, Lakota uh, works. So they were appropriating different designs from white culture. And the vest, a lot of times they would receive those in annuities and to make them Lakota, they would fully bead them rather than just accepting um, the sort of donations from the government. So that's another thing we see as a through line. I think that dynamic is really interesting, Dan, of kind of how Lakota women are navigating um, a new social and political position that they didn't ask for um, and that was forced upon them, but that they're still finding to assert Lakota culture and Lakota identity um, while still navigating um, the oppressive structures of having been forced to live on a reservation. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the joke about Lakota women beating anything that stands still is funny, but it's also sad. <laughs> Um, because it's a very direct sort of outgrowth of folks not having the freedom of movement and folks kind of being forced to have the time to be still and to fully be these garments. And so I think that makes the choices of what gets beaded all the more significant. Um, and so, you know, like on these pants, which how would you, how big would you say they are for scale? I'm trying to remember from being in the gallery and I feel like they're maybe like two and a half feet long. Yeah, I would say they're probably the size for like a five-year-old, if I were to guess. Yeah. And the boots okay. are, are for a much younger child. That would be like a one to two-year-old, I would say. But you, the, yeah. the thing I love about the boots is you actually see scuff marks on the heel. So we know a child really did wear these. Yeah. You know, we actually have um, a question about the photograph of the Lakota family oh, sure. that we just showed. Um, so, you know, if you don't mind, I'm going to scoot back to that image for a second. Mm -hmm. And our question is, um, it seems like the mother and the older girl are in uh, cloth associated with uh, white colonists and settlers and the little kids are in beaded cloth. Um, Dare, do you have any sort of comments on why that might be? So I, I don't know this this specific woman. I, I wish that her story would have been, you know, written down in history. But sadly, mm -hmm. most of these stories would have been um, mediated through white reservation agents who sort of sanitized the details or didn't even speak to women in the first place. So if I were to um, hypothesize why this might be is thinking about the role that women played, they were the ones beating the, the material. And in the, girl, in the case of the girl's bonnet, that would have been worn by a small child. So if I'm thinking about the role that women are assuming, that young girl is, is on the cusp of womanhood and she's actually using this little cradle model to um, house a Victorian doll. So we see her sort of emulating that role of the ideal mother caring for her child. Um, so if I were to hypothesize, that would be what I would, I would guess, is that these women are caretakers and their children need to be protected right now. Mm -hmm. They see it as their responsibility to protect them. But thank you. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Natalia. I hope I've not mispronounced your name. <laughs> so, so I have a question for you as we sort of transition to these images. Um, I, I know that the BMA is currently closed. Are there ways for folks to explore this exhibition online? Can you tell us a little bit more what the presence is? Yeah. Um, so actually this show is not closed. Most of the oh, museum great. is. So if you wanna see it, we're still awesome. open because this is right next to the lobby and we wanted to give people an opportunity who are visiting our restaurant Gertrude's or the shop to pop in and see it. So it is possible to see it. And then we do have select images of it on, of pieces online as well. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. You are on site today and you are looking for it. As you walk in, you look to the left, you're gonna see this horse mask. Yeah. Uh, there is just no way to miss it. Um, and it is mounted at horse height, um, which is pretty dramatic. So there, I'm interested in maybe hearing a little bit about why uh, we see the flag kind of uh, along kind of the horse's cheek on one side, but then all across the other side of that mass. Um, you know, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful object. And I'd be interested in hearing more about its design. Sure. So I think to, in order to discuss the design, we need to think about the context that this was viewed. So these, this mask would have been worn by a horse during a 4th of July parade. And viewers may be asking themselves, why would the Lakota celebrate the 4th of July? And that's a really interesting story to unpack. The biggest reason was that the 4th of July pretty neatly overlapped with the time of year in which a really important ceremony, the Sundance, normally took place. Um, and the Sundance was outlawed by this, this um, law that was passed in the 1880s called the Code of Indian Offenses. And that series of laws banned things like traditional dances, puberty ceremonies, and even speaking the Lakota language. And obviously that last piece was hard to enforce because these people didn't speak English, um, so they didn't have another means to communicate. So when we think about why they might want to embrace the 4th of July, we need to consider um, the fact that if they, when they did so, they were allowed to gather and do these dances and do pu puberty ceremonies and do things called giveaways in which the wealthy Lakota would provide goods for the needy. Um, and any other time of year that would not have been possible. So we see a profusion of flags on objects that were created in conjunction with that event. And this horse mask would have been worn during a, a parade. And one thing interesting about it is thinking about the message it communicates with some of the flags being backwards by our interpretation today. And when I went into the, when I first saw this piece, I really considered why that would be. And then I walked around to the other side and we see there that it's facing the normal direction. And when we think about this object moving in a parade, if this horse had a flag above its head and it was moving forward, this would be the direction that it would be facing on both sides. So we have this nod to um, the way that it was intended to be used. And we see this intricate design on the, the side, the side shown on the right um of this horse and here we see some other hallmarks of uh, lakota design with really fine um, detailing very intricate shapes that are that are alluded to we see triangles to represent mountain motifs so we see a really lakota um, embedded message on that side of the horse. So we have kind of two audiences that we're speaking to, mm -hmm. the white reservation agent and the Lakota people who would really appreciate the detailing on the, the right side of the horse. Mm -hmm. So I love this object and it feels so dramatic. I, I did research on how tall horses would have been in this time period in the United States. So we, we did really think through that display quite a bit and I'm really happy right. about the drama of this piece. I really I love that, that this piece is incorporating the sort of, sorry. <laughs> I really love that this piece is incorporating some of the more traditional motifs in, in Lakota beadwork and also sort of stylizing the flag um, by virtue of just um, sort of practicality, right? That the, the stars become sort of more um, four pointed crosses than, than stars themselves. So that's, it's this interesting melding in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, there 
I want to go back to this idea of putting the flag kind of, or the U.S. flag as a cover uh, for Lakota cultural practices and being able to, you know, do the giveaway, do the puberty ceremonies. Um, and I think we have uh, a photograph here of another activity that might have been uh, associated with this 4th of July celebration. Yeah, absolutely. So the 4th of July celebration often extended to about a week where people would gather and on each different day, there would be some different activities. So some of them were mock battles, others were parades in which giveaways would happen. And here we see an event that would usually happen on the 4th of July itself, in which white reservation agents would read the Declaration of Independence to gathered groups of Lakota people. And this was a really important activity because because it solidified this message of we're celebrating the 4th of July um, to the white reservation agents who are overseeing the event. So it's this sort of like almost code switching happening um, with this event versus the, the parades that took place. So this was a part of a yeah. series of events. I think, you know, it's interesting that you use the term code switching because um, and for those of you who haven't heard the term before, it's both an NPR show, but it's also a term for linguistics uh, that talks about kind of moving from uh, one kind of linguistic dialect or register to another to sort of indicate that you are a part of different social groups um, and to be in with those distinct social groups. Um, and, you know, another thing that was sort of coming to mind earlier when we were looking at the uh, the boys' vest and also the pants and the boots is that it almost seems like there is um, kind of a respectability politics by necessity of trying to make the Lakota, you know, family be a unit to be respected by the white reservation agents. Um, and that, that, you know, I'm sort of seeing some, some parallels with the present in terms of how folks can be very deliberate in terms of their self-presentation um, to kind of protect themselves to make their passage through the world safer um, and potentially uh, less fraught. So it's, it's interesting to see kind of the historical and contemporary parallels. Um, so I think maybe we can move through a couple more uh, works from the show. And then I also feel like speaking of the contemporary moment, we might wanna <laughs> move closer to the present. Absolutely. So, Derek, yeah, can you give us like a quick view of what we're looking at and then we'll uh, make our way? Sure. To <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'll give a really brief sort of comment about this. This would be, uh, or this was a possible bag or a saddle bag. Um, mm -hmm. Possible bag just was a, a reference to it could hold every possible thing. So we would see this at, during the either the 4th of July or related events. And I see a question in the chat saying, are crosses related to Christianity or is it a traditional mm -hmm. Lakota design? So they are in traditional Lakota um, visual vernacular, they were meant to represent stars. And when we think about the medium of beadwork, it's really difficult to be able to create a five-pointed star. The saddlebag is unique in its ability to have that, but the stars are really large. They take a lot of beads to be able to have that five-pointed star. So normally just the plus sign would be um, indicative of a, a star. So we see the saddlebag here, we see the iconic eagle. Um, and then let's scoot forward one more. We see a man's vest here where the plus sign is used um, for the, the stars on the flag. And one more. Here we see a quilled pouch. So before the um, popularization of the um, of beadwork in the mid 19th century, women typically did their designs using porcupine quills that would be worked um, in a way that would allow them to be dyed or you know, sort of pieced together. And with quills, if we think of quills, um, they're very straight. And that also informed some of the design choices in beadwork. So even though beads could take on different shapes, they 
artists were used to working it with this other material that had a very a strong linearity to it. So that also supports this idea of um, stars being the plus symbol. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting kind of material connection between the quills moving into the uh, glass seed beads and kind of translating patterns from one form into another. Yeah. And speaking of transitions. Yes. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dare. I'm glad that you're going to be joining us for the entire episode because I'm curious to hear your thoughts on our next sort of topic. And um, it's interesting you're talking about this this sort these um, Lakota women being really sort of multimedia artists, right? They're using seed beads that are made of glass. They're using porcupine quills. Our next artist, John Quick to see Smith, um, is a contemporary Native American artist, and she herself, um, though she considers herself a painter in a lot of respects, she is really interested in, in using collage as a, a major point of, of consideration in her work. So why don't we take a look at our first image. For those of you who are unfamiliar with John Quick to see Smith, she was born in 1940 uh, at the St. Ignatius Indian Mission on the Flathead Reservation in St. Ignatius, Montana. She is an enrolled Salish member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Nation, Montana. She's also of Métis and Shoshone descent. And I'm excited to interest, in, introduce everyone to this particular work, which is called Indian Indio Indigenous. And it is part of the National Museum of Women in the Arts permanent collection. Um, it's exciting to me because it was created sort of on the occasion of another American sort of celebration. This was completed in 1992, um, which for um, white Americans, it was a major year of celebration, considering um, that it was the 500th anniversary of Columbus sort of arriving in the Americas. Um, just to kind of draw your attention to the visual elements of this work and so that we can understand it, um, it's a very large diptych. It's two panels. It's about five feet by eight feet wide, a little over eight feet wide, actually. Um, and what we see here is um, a really sort of heavy concentration of collage sort of in the midsection, um, which I call sort of the horizon line of this particular work. It's sort of, there's collage throughout, really, but it sort of begins to sort of disperse a bit as you get to the edges. And I think what's important about that, um, there are a lot of things and we'll talk about collage elements, but I also think it creates the sense of a horizon line really. And Quick to See Smith really talks about this work and others like it as um, sort of uh, narrative landscapes that both introduce um, her, her history as well as sort of the history of the land of the United States. So as we, maybe let's take a look at the next image. I think that'll give us, we're gonna take a look at some details here. Um, this is actually a, a detailed shot of one of the collage elements, and it's actually the masthead of Jean Quick to see Smith's reservation newspaper, Charcusta. And um, I find it really interesting that she's playing a lot with, with language, especially pulling from, her collage source, sources are, are wide. We're seeing newspaper, um, clippings. We see fabric actually in this work, a variety of fabric, uh, as well as uh, some drawings and, and other images. And this I think is really, um, oh, you can go ahead. Yeah, that's great. Um, and oh, this really um, sort of, I think these two first two images about this work are really important because they sort of identify this work as a work by a Native American artist, as well as it dates it in a very particular place and time, right? So 1992, um, Dara, I know you um, can tell us a little bit more about an important exhibition that actually occurred that same year. Yeah, so 1992 was a year of great trauma to Native mm -hmm. Americans, seeing all of these celebrations um, really, really sort of put natives on the spot in a sense. Um, so in response to it, Quick to see Smith curated a show in 1992 called sub Show Columbus Woes, a visual commentary on the Col Columbus Quincentennial from the perspective of America's first people. Mm -hmm. um, and I, when I read this title, I'm like, what does sub mean? And then I discovered that it's Columbus spelled backwards. Um, so really <laughs> this show explored uh, colonialism's legacy in the US and called attention to the continuation mm -hmm. of colonization of indigenous peoples, as well as the commodification of native cultures. Mm -hmm. And the show offered really profound reflections on 
family and personal and tribal history. And even though I was a baby um, in 19 or a young person in 1992, I, this really resonates with me. I'm native myself. And so just thinking about how these native artists reacted to this moment and really called attention to the complicated history um, and why maybe they wouldn't, or they definitely didn't feel celebratory of, around this year of 1992. So I yeah. think it's very interesting. Yeah, thank you. I think what's, um, thank you for sharing that information. I think what's important too to keep in mind about Quick to See Smith is she is not only a visual artist, if that, if that were an only, that's a lot of work in and of itself, but she <laughs> takes on additional roles in her community, one of which is a curator to sort of highlight and, and bring to sort of the larger community, uh, the work of Native people. And um, this was a really important show in her sort of body of work as a curator. She identifies as a cultural arts worker. So she really is sort of not just making work. She's speaking regularly, she's lecturing, and she's creating these, these exhibitions. And she also spoke recently with the um, NMAI, um, the American Indian Museum, as part of the Smithsonian, she talked a lot about how there's very little sort of scholarship about Native American artists. And so for her, that's a really important part of, of curating shows as well. Um, she plays with language a lot. Um, we know by the title of that exhibition, but also within her work, she sort of embeds language in really interesting and in ways that sort of challenge us, right? And I know that um, we had a great conversation about this title when we when we started talking about the show, Indian, Indio, Indigenous. And it's not just the title, it is a feature point of this canvas. It's a, a major moment or passage on the right half, um, just right of center. And it's, it's painted in blood red paint and it's sort of dripping. Um, so it really, it really draws our eye. And I'm, I'm curious, Veronica, what your thoughts are about sort of um, Smith's use of language in this particular work. Yeah, um, so for me, one of the things that uh, jumps out is that it is a bilingual uh, title. Um, this is, you know, Indian, Indio is the Spanish word for Indian, mm -hmm. um, and then indigenous. And so that inclusion of Spanish, I think, is really interesting um, because given that this is, you know, the 500 year uh recognition, either mourning or commemoration or celebration of uh, Columbus uh, getting lost in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that's, that's where my family is from. <laughs> so, um, they're, they're just kind of showed up because they were lost. Um, but they weren't just lost. They were also, you know, Columbus was bankrolled by the Spanish crown. Um, and so I think this linkage of Spanish is significant historically, both because I think it uh, reinforces the many uh, routes of European colonization that uh, intersected um with the native peoples of the americas um and points to for me sort of this more hemispheric understanding of the fact that there were and are indigenous peoples from you know the bering strait to tierra del fuego mm -hmm. um and that the americas are an indigenous space mm -hmm. um and so to have that kind of marked with the word indio sandwiched between indian and indigenous I think is a really significant inclusion um, on Quick to See Smith's part. Um, and it also kind of, you know, points out just how complex um, kind of the, the politics, the, the history of like people being on land. Um, because, I'm, you know, it all like the inclusion of Spanish for me brings up the phrase, you know, in talking about the U.S. Mexico border, like families who say we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. Um, and so, mm -hmm. thinking about the way that language is one means by which the way that they get named is a way of asserting power. Over them. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and so, I think you know the uh, the the, the toggling between two languages, stacking it really sort of I think highlights. Like what does it what does it mean to 
plant a flag? What does it mean to pinpoint something on a map and to assert this is the way I know something, this is the way that it will be known? There's a real nudge and political claim associated with it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's, those are my two cents on that. <laughs> Well, absolutely. I think, um, you know, to your point about sort of how we, we use lang- language as being one of our ways of sort of categorizing and organizing, right? I think another one is um, sort of drawing drawing those boundaries, drawing those borders, creating lines between, on land between one space and another and sort of saying that they are a state or um, a piece of property owned um, by a group of people. And I, I think that is another really important part of jean Quick de C. Smith's work. She's been investigating and really exploring the idea of maps throughout her career mm-hmm. and what a map means um, to Native people as well as to um, white Americans. And um, I'm curious, um, you know, to hear your thoughts, both of you, about this inclusion. Um, is par- this is part of the Indian, 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 Indigenous piece, and it's actually sort of a, a ripped out section of a road atlas, uh, specifically of Idaho. And I'm just, I'm curious what your thoughts are about about her incorporation of this particular map in this work. So one thing that stands out to me is this square in the bottom left. And Mm -hmm. this actually is the, um, this marks the Indian reservation. I forget which, Duck Valley, I think. Yeah, in, um, that crosses the border of Idaho. And when we think about the way that native people understand landscape, it's relational. It it actually takes into consideration the nature of the land. So this Mm -hmm. idea that a square is superimposed on this this um, map wouldn't make sense to a lot of native people who would rather, you know, focus on the river as a sort of border. So I think that it's a very um, white uh, designation and understanding mm-hmm. of the terrain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and that also is a direct outgrowth of just planning um, and the way that land was taken by the U.S. government and then distributed for the express purpose of having control over how the U.S. settled and expanded its political power into native terrain. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that inclusion of the map here, like a map is is not just about that moment, it also documents the history that kind of got to this particular understanding of that area. Um, So I think it's really, it's interesting for quick to see Smith to include this because it's it also invites the question of like when in a map it's because you're trying to figure out maybe where you are or where you're going there's sort of this implicit question of orientation and i think that also ties in with like this this 500 year marker of a you know world changing event um and sort of thinking about like how do we make sense of that um, how do we make sense of where we go next? So I think for me, that's all part of this uh, implicit question um, that she's putting forth with uh, a really expansive painting. Mm-hmm. I also think that particular area of the map is interesting because it sort of, it shows us, you know, it's that square, that abnormal human drawn square of land is also directly bisected by by two US states. So it sort of it feels very sort of violently separated, even though realistically it's not, or you know, re- in reality it isn't. But it, it to me it's sort of a, a mini version in a way of this entire composition that she's created. I do want to share some of the words of Quick to See Smith because as I said, she's been really exploring the ideas of maps um, for many years now. And since the early 2000s, she's created a series of paintings incorporating the United States. She's actually painted the map of the United States. But the borders are, they're there, but they're subtle and they're sort of 
overlaid by dripping paint. So the suggestion of sort of the malleability of borders. Um, and two of the really, two really interesting works that I invite people to sort of seek out. One is called State Names and it's in the Smithsonian American Art Museum's collection. And the other made in the same year, 2000, is called Tribal Map and it's part of the MFA Boston's collection. So if you're curious to see some of those works, I invite you to do that. But I do wanna share a quote about her relationship to maps. Um, jean quick de C. Smith said in 2004, we are the original owners of this country. Our land was stolen from us by the Euro-American invaders. I can't say strongly enough that my maps are about stolen land, our very heritage, our cultures, our worldview, our being. Every map is a political map and tells a story that we are alive and everywhere across this nation. I think it's a really powerful commentary on how she processes and incorporates maps in her work. Um, it's all very heavy and serious, but Quick to See Smith is hilarious too. As part of this lecture I watched <laughs> recently, she joked around actually about how she didn't really know that she could become an artist as a child. She didn't know that was a profession. And then she was introduced to um, tempera paints and um, crayons when she was in first grade. And she said, they didn't taste very good, but they were really great to work with. And so I wanna sort of switch gears. She talks a lot about this idea of survivor humor as sort of sardonic wit that's, um, she identifies as sort of um, Native American attitude towards processing um, grief and loss. And she is incorporating moments of comedy and humor in this particular work. And I know one other passage that I know Veronica was interested in and, and curious about is this section. Um, it's a, a Blondie comic strip from um, a newspaper that she's included. Uh, Veronica, do you want to share your thoughts on that? Sure, I'm happy to. But also, I mean, speaking of Quick to See Smith's wit and her wordplay, I mean, this little, you can't ignore this little yeah. bubble uh, below that says, oh, zone. Um, <laughs> this is my interpretation of her reading. I don't know if she would agree with that exact uh, pronunciation. But, you know, given this is 1992, it also harkens back to like mm -hmm. the issue of, you know, the hole in the ozone was huge. Um, and so that little bubble for me is another kind of uh, cheeky pointed turn um, at just this major global problem that we were facing um, at that time. And to have it juxtaposed next to mm -hmm. this Blondie strip um, is, I, I think, really uh, kind of interesting. Um, because for those of you who are unfamiliar with Blondie, um, it was a comic strip that I think was uh, begun in the 1930s, um, Blondie was a, the titular, the titular character, um, was this flapper who was happy-go-lucky. Uh, she did what she wants. She was kind of the, meant to be the picture of the modern white urban woman. Um, and then, somewhere along the lines, she gets married to Dagwood Bumstead. And so we see this little like household drama happening here where it's kind of hard to tell, but uh, we spent a little while peering at it, um, and there's a door that is stuck somewhere in the house, and it's just not opening, it's not closing, and so Dagwood takes it off the hinges and is going to shave the edges down so that the door swings freely. And, I don't know, he says something along the lines of, like, no piece of wood is going to get the door of Dagwood Bumstead. This door is going to close or else. And somehow that's a plan. Um, <laughs> a sense of, like, <laughs> these strips are not super funny on a daily basis. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but that's also in part because they never change. Um, like this, this strip uh, is from October 27th, 1992, um, presumably. And like this dynamic that Blondie and Dad would have in this strip is something that you could see in a Blondie strip that got published today or tomorrow. Um, because the characters are just kind of in stasis mm -hmm. um and for the inclusion of a strip that is like sort of supposed to be funny but is also very much about kind of sticking uh sticking people in almost amber like in this mm. this time that never changes it very slowly shifts um i think is you know significant because quick to see smith is kind of pointing out um the way that maybe some people are uh, have 
are given the power to determine history and have sort of the agency to craft their own narratives, to, you know, create the grand arcs and other people get stuck in these boxes mm -hmm. of this slow moving time. Um, and I think that that's a dynamic that is, um, I think really powerful. Uh, to look at sort of in this context um, and just sort of thinking about things like a daily newspaper as sort of the means of marking time. Mm -hmm. And you've got these comic strips that are sort of providing the humor and the levity in your day, but it's also the thing that is delivering news of some portions of the world to you. So there's, you know, there's both the trauma, there's also the humor. It's kind of this I think there's a lot of complexity. I mean, mm -hmm. That could really be the subtitle for this. I, I'd love to talk to the artist more, right? <laughs> I'd love to, I'm curious about why the inclusion of this particular storyline, right? But I think too that perhaps Blondie has this representation of sort of quote unquote ideal Americana, right? They lived there, a white couple, lily white couple living in this suburban tract house and sort of what is the American dream or how do I, how do we see the American dream? How does that manifest in different, in different, you know, in different cultures within this country? So I think it's, there's a lot there that can kind of be unpacked. I think um, in terms of, I know we're almost finished today, but if we can just go on to the last slide, it's just, again, another sort of whole view of um, something we've mined for meaning today. And I would say that, you know, I'm I'm really proud that the Women's Museum acquired this in 1992. I think Jean Quick to see Smith is just um, now beginning to be collected by larger institutions, but we really have been celebrating her work since it was created. Um, and I will say that NIMWA is still open to the public with timed ticketing and plenty of social distance. So if you all, if you're in the, if our viewers are in the DC area and feel comfortable visiting, I'd invite you to join us at the museum. Uh, just simply go onto our website to, to purchase tickets and reserve your slot. This work of art is currently on view at the museum as well. So I'd, I'd really encourage you to come and see it in person. It's a really, um, quite an enveloping work of art. Um, and I just, I wanna thank Dara again for joining us and having a conversation Absolutely. about a work that she was, yeah, new to her, so yeah. It's great to yeah. be here. And there is so much to see in this painting. Um, and similarly, uh, the BMA, and this is actually, somebody had a question in the comments, what is the BMA? Happy to tell you, <laughs> it's the Baltimore Museum of Art. Uh, so it's where I work, it's where Dara works, it's where you can go to see Stripes and Stars reclaiming Lakota independence, um, which is on view. It's it's a one gallery show that has beautiful work, um, really big stories in a small space. Uh, and I definitely encourage you um, to visit uh, if you feel uh, safe and comfortable doing so. Mm -hmm. um, I do see that we have one maybe last question that we didn't address uh, in the chat which was, uh, I think, about the Lakota beadwork, um, specifically the quilled pouch. And mm -hmm. Bex Vega wants to know, were the beads themselves made of quills, or did they use the porcupine quills like a needle? Oh. So the porcupine quills on the work would have been um, flattened. People would chew on them and then apply them as applique mm -hmm. on top. So they weren't beads themselves. The beads were introduced in about the 1840s, um, Larger beads were introduced through trade and those were all glass and they were coming from far away places like Venice. Um, so those were acquired through trade and the, the quilled pouch has both quills and a little bit of beadwork on the bottom of it. So I hope that answers your question. And then I think I saw uh, the, the exhibit will be open through the end of March. So Stripes and Stars Lakota, Reclaiming Lakota Independence. You have a few months to see it. Congratulations on the show, Dare. It's exciting. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Right. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's been lovely to have you all join us in the chat. Um, and just as a reminder, BMA NIMWA is a monthly thing. So we will see you again in January, uh, where we'll be looking at the theme of here and now, uh, looking at site-specific work. Uh, so come back second Tuesday of the month at noon, we'll be here, wherever <laughs> here is. <laughs> Until then, everyone stay safe. Stay safe, take care. <laughs>